announced plans to construct a new megacity in the northwestern corner of the country by the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. The ambitious project will cost about $500 billion and seeks to link to neighboring Egypt and Jordan. Besides its economic feasibility, the proximity of the project could lead to Saudi Arabia's recognition of Israel. Suffice to say, a project of this magnitude is not without its geoeconomic challenges. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Crown Prince bin Salman revealed his flagship project during the Future Investment Initiative on October 24th. The proposal, called NEOM, takes NEO, as in new, from Latin, and M from the word for mustakbal, which means future, in Arabic. So the project literally translates to new future. The terminology of the megacity is a reference to Saudi Arabia's quest to reform its economy and prepare itself for the post-oil environment. The blueprint of the NEOM project envisions a city that hosts a variety of industries, including biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, digital services, as well as commerces that focus on energy, water, food, media, and even entertainment. To top things off, the plan is to integrate disruptive technologies and innovations into the city. For instance, public transportation in the city will be run by autonomous vehicles. Robots will handle repetitive tasks and power will derive from solar and wind energy, etc. This may sound overly ambitious, but it is easier to design a new city and integrate disruptive innovations into it than it is to merge these technologies into existing cities. The blueprint for this aspiring megacity is set at $500 billion. For Crown Prince bin Salman, the only way to acquire the necessary funds is to sell a part of Saudi Aramco and fill the treasury of the Public Investment Fund, which is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund. From there, the Saudis could finance the development of the megacity. Klaus Kleinfeld, the former CEO of Siemens AG and Alcoa, oversees the Saudi project. He will have to bring in private investors to fill in the remaining funds for the project. Already, the Japanese multinational SoftBank Group has agreed to buy a significant stake in the state-controlled Saudi electric company that will provide renewable energy for the new megacity. The Saudi government hasn't published a master plan for this city yet, but it has released a promotional video which depicted not only a thriving city, but also a lifestyle that is absent in the modern Saudi kingdom. The footage portrayed women jogging and actively participating in the public life. This is a far cry from the current situation, but as we pointed out before, economic reform in Saudi Arabia will have to be accompanied by social change. Judging by the promotional video, the blueprint for the NEOM project implies that the new megacity will operate independently from the existing governmental structure and the Saudi government. The city could have its own regulations, laws and taxes. In this context, the Saudi project shares many of the characteristics that are present in other free economic zones, such as in Dubai and Singapore. These existing cities have their own laws and regulations, and thus operate separately from the rest of their respective governments. And just as Dubai and Singapore are located near strategic straits, so too does the NEOM project sit near global maritime choke points. About 10% of the world's trade passes through the Suez Canal and the Mandab Strait, located in Egypt and in between Yemen and Djibouti respectively. Developing a new industrial and financial megahub that borders a trade active area carries substantial potential. But such a project is not without its challenges. The Niam megacity is set at the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba and seeks to connect to Egypt and Jordan 
across the Straits of Tiran, which is a narrow passage between the Sinai and Arabian peninsulas. Last year, Egypt accepted Saudi Arabia's sovereignty over the islands of Tiran and Sanafir that sit in the Straits in exchange for billions of dollars in aid. However, connecting Egypt, Saudi Arabia and Jordan will require the construction of a 10-kilometer bridge and causeway, which will allow the countries to carry rail and road traffic across the Straits of Tehran. However, the 1979 peace treaty between Egypt and Israel guarantees the latter's access to the Red Sea. An infrastructure project that crosses the Straits of Tehran would, therefore, violate Israel's access to the Red Sea under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Israel has been firm in its stance towards the Straits of Tehran. In 1967, Egypt's closure of the Straits to Israeli shipping was one of the reasons for the Six-Day War, meaning Israeli involvement in the Neon project is critical for the success of the venture and it's likely to result in Saudi Arabia's formal recognition of the State of Israel. For Israel, the Neon project is of exception value. The Israeli high-speed railway project to Eilat, which is a port city by the Gulf of Aqaba, serves as an ideal complementary component of the Saudi megacity. By extending the Neon project with the overland transshipment of the Eilat railway, the Saudi project would appeal to global maritime trading powers such as China. Beijing already has outstanding relations with both Israel and Saudi Arabia and would therefore eagerly cooperate with both parties in the Neom and the Eilat railway projects. In the long term, however, cooperation and recognition from Egypt and Saudi Arabia could also help Israel to mend ties with its Arab neighbors. Hence, the Neon project offers not only financial opportunities, but also marks the first geopolitical opening for Israel to reconcile with its neighbors. Since reconciliation with the Arab nations is fundamental to the geopolitical interests of Israel, American and Israeli policymakers could throw their weights behind the Neon project. That said, an agreement between Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Jordan would have to go through the back channels, since a public debate on such matters would lead to a blowback in the Arab nations. Such back channels already exist between Saudi and Israeli firms, especially in the sphere of water conservation, cybersecurity, etc. And these agreements usually go through US subsidiaries. That's also how a NEOM related agreement to the Gulf of Aqaba and the Straits of Tehran will likely be reached. In essence, the NEOM project has no shortage of ambition. The Saudi government aims to complete the first stage of the megacity by the end of 2025, and it has already allocated more than 26,000 square kilometers for the development of the project. To put that in perspective, that is larger than the state of New Jersey, or slightly smaller than the nation of Belgium. If the project succeeds, it would propel Saudi Arabia into the post-oil era. It would also designate the country as one of the leaders in utilizing disruptive innovations in the development of new cities. However, as grand as the Saudi project is, there is no guarantee that any of this will go according to plan. Previous Saudi plans to create modern cities have all failed. For instance, in 2005, Construction began on the King Abdullah Economic City, which lies around 100 kilometers north of Jeddah. Initially, the project had a budget of $100 billion and was expected to be completed by 2010. Today, however, construction is still ongoing and the project needs additional financial stimulants. So there is no guarantee that the new megacity will be any different from the previous Saudi projects. As such, the reception of the NEON project has been met with mixed results. Some applaud bin Salman for boldly driving the kingdom towards reform, while others 
point to past failed attempts to overhaul the Saudi economy. Yet, regardless of its feasibility, the Saudi government has no choice but to try and find ways to move away from its dependency on energy revenues. The country must take advantage of its current financial resources to implement economic reform while it is still able to do so. As we have explained in an earlier report, Bin Salman's young age means that he will rule the country for the next decades. This means that unlike his predecessors, he cannot pass the necessary economic reforms to the next ruler. He has to find ways to create enough sustainable wealth to avoid social unrest. That is the primary purpose of the Neon project. If the crown prince fails, the consequences will come back to haunt him. In this regard, Bin Salman will be the man who either makes or breaks the Saudi Kingdom. So despite the tenability of the Neom megacity, the Crown Prince believes it's a project worth As it relates to specifically Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18, in the, dis the description of mystery, Babylon the Great, again I don't want to jump to conclusions, I don't want to um, develop a theology or an eschatology based on current events. However, having studied a lot of this in the scriptures, I think the announcement that was made last week potentially has incredible ramifications for the future um, for Israel, for Christians, and for the world as it relates to the last days. So I want all of us to be aware of it. Um, again, I'm not going on record as saying that this is it but I do want you to be aware of it because I think it dovetails amazingly, at least on paper, with what, what the scriptures have to say about Mystery Babylon the Great in the last days. There was an announcement by uh, King Solomon of Saudi Arabia. He is a uh, young <coughs> king that has just taken over Saudi Arabia <coughs> several years. Um, his father, um, was trying to find a way to transition Saudi Arabia from oil-based economy to something else. The same way that Dubai, uh, and we don't have it on the screen, but Dubai on the, on the eastern side of Arabia on the Persian Gulf across from Iran, uh, that Dubai has been transitioning for several years now away from an oil-based economy in the Persian Gulf. The premier that was ruling there saw the handwriting on the wall and said at some point we're going to run out of oil and so we need to transition to a different, in a different economy and so that's really how Dubai has blossomed out of the sands of Arabia into a thriving huge city. Um, some of the tallest skyscrapers in the world, the world's busiest international airport in a very short period of time. And I tell you that because Saudi Arabia itself, I think, is looking to do what Dubai did, but, or the United Arab Emirates, where Dubai is located, but they're looking to put it into a higher overdrive than even what happened in Dubai. And what I tell you now is significant because Dubai did it so quickly in a very short period of time, you went from absolute deserts to thriving, huge skyscrapers, <coughs> businesses, hotels, um, tourism in a very short period of time. The announcement that was made, and let me back up just another minute just to give you a little more context. Saudi Arabia is very concerned that they move away from an oil-based economy as the United Arab Emirates was concerned. Saudi Arabia has all kinds of issues. Basically, they export two things. Um, they export oil and they export religion. Of course, Saudi Arabia is the, the seat of Mecca, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and it is the center of the Islamic world. Mecca is located about 50 miles off of the Red Sea, off the bottom of the map here. 50 miles inland from the Red Sea, a little bit further south, about down in this location. 
Um, Mecca is being transformed in an amazing way in the middle of the desert. If I showed you pictures of Mecca and in some of the presentations that we've been doing recently, we're, we're actually showing people images we did on the cruise. Um, much of Mecca is being bulldozed by the Saudis. In the center of Mecca is something called the Kaaba. It is a large black cube which is the center of Islamic worship. And Muslims from all over the world make pilgrimage to Mecca and there are all kinds of things that they do during the pilgrimage in front of this black cube which to Muslims is the closest place or the gateway to Allah. They make this Hajj or pilgrimage and they're supposed to do it at least once in their life. Some do it more than that. And you have millions and millions and millions of people coming from all over the world, Muslims, to Mecca in Saudi Arabia to make this pilgrimage to the Hajj. Around the Hajj, around that, that Kaaba in the center of Mecca, they are bulldozing huge segments of Mecca to make way for skyscrapers. As a matter of fact, the world's tallest, uh, excuse me, the world's largest building by square footage, uh, it's called the Royal Clock Tower, was built in Mecca overlooking the Kaaba with a large lunar crescent, the symbol of Islam on the top of it, uh, biggest clock tower in the world. Seven, made up of seven towers all together with over 4,000 shops inside. Giant shopping mall, restaurants, hotels, Four Seasons Hotel, high end, and all around this large black cube where, where Muslims <coughs> come to pilgrimage, they are completely redoing the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Why? Because the monarchy and those who run Saudi Arabia want to modernize they want to bring lots of dollar revenue to the city. They want to increase tourism, religious tourism in particular. Um, so they are completely transitioning. Now, the father of the man who is now running Saudi Arabia, he started another city called KAEC, King Abdullah Economic City, which is located right on the Red Sea. King Abdul Abdullah Economic City with universities, and golf courses and hotels and a huge, huge port. It is now, in just a very short period of time, one of the top 100 ports on planet Earth. And they're continuing to grow it at a rapid rate. Now, all of that is a backdrop for what the announcement was this past week. And the announcement from King Solomon of Saudi Arabia was that Saudi Arabia is creating a city-state within the confines of the Arabian Peninsula a city-state. Now I'll get to the ramifications of that in just a moment. The city-state is to be called Neom, N-E-O-M. Think of Neo meaning new, N-E-O, new, and then the M it stands for a word which I won't try to pronounce to you in Arabic, which, which kind of symbolizes the idea of future. So Neom is new future. At least that's what's being said that it stands for as an acronym, okay? Uh, new future. The king, who's about, I think, 32, 33 years of age, wants to completely transform Saudi Arabia. To, to show you how much he wants to do that, first of all, he invited Donald Trump to go over there in recent days, saying, we're going to eradicate radical Islam. Now, Saudi Arabia has been a major source of radical Islam in the world through the Wahhabist movement for many, many decades. But King Solomon says, I want to change I want to completely transition away from the radicalism that's here and reinvent Saudi Arabia for modern age. Mm. So he has announced Neom, which is a city state that is 23,500 kilometer, square kilometers. That equates to, according to my math, 14,000 plus square miles. Huge. 33 times bigger than the area of New York City. And he's putting 600 hundred and forty billion dollars into Neom to create this new futuristic city using the highest robotics technology on planet Earth that the world has ever known. <coughs> the location of Neom is in this range, in this location, all the way down the Gulf of Aqaba, <coughs> in this locale right here. That's the location of Neom. Now, what is so amazing about what the king said is that this $640 billion city-state is going to have new laws. It will not be governed by the laws 
of Saudi Arabia today. It's going to have a new administration. So it essentially is an autonomous zone within the confines of Saudi Arabia that will have modernization and what did he say? No old traditions in the city-state. No old traditions. And he's made it clear that he is pushing the Wahhabist radical element within Saudi Arabia, pushing them out of power. There's a conflict within Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, the same king said, we're going to establish, you can see over here some islands, but further south off of the King Abdul economic city and further south, he's creating another zone, a resort zone, where women are allowed to wear bikinis. Now this is in Saudi Arabia, where up until his announcement just a few months ago, or a month or so ago, women weren't even allowed to drive a car. Saudi Arabia is liberalizing faster than you can imagine, away from radical Islam. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a huge component of radical Islam that is entrenched and ingrained within not only government officials, but a lot of the people who live there. But Saudi Arabia's average age is less, 50%, 50% of the population of Saudi Arabia is less than 25 years old. Can you imagine that? And they have a huge population of people from other parts of the world mm. who they have brought in to do a lot of the work in the transformation of the country, to build, to run things, to be a servers, to do all those kinds of things. And what you have is a, a lot of people that are coming in from other parts of the world that are poor, they give over their passports, and many within Saudi Arabia are controlling those people because they control the passports, the people can't leave, and essentially they become slaves. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Saudi Arabia is absolutely remarkable right now. So this city, the city-state, with new laws, new administration, and an autonomous zone within Saudi Arabia called Niyam, $640 billion, is designed to connect, and this is in the king's words, to connect Egypt, here's Egypt over here and the Sinai Peninsula, with Saudi Arabia and Jordan. So what you have is this, and he announced that he wants to build a bridge over the Red Sea to connect from Neom, I'll just, here for you so you can see it, from Neom to Egypt and to connect to Jordan. <clears throat> what he is attempting to do is to galvanize his allies in the region. Now why is Saudi Arabia so concerned about galvanizing its allies in the region? Because it is scared to death of Iran. And Iran, again it's not on the map, the Persian Gulf is over here which separates Saudi Arabia from Iran. And we all know from the news that Iran is developing nuclear weapons. And Iran is not shy about saying to everyone that we're going to use them on you if you cross us. Saudi Arabia, remember, is the center of Islam worldwide. However, Saudi Arabia is principally Sunni, division within Islam. Iran is Shia. So you have two major divisions within Islam. They don't like each other at all. So Saudi Arabia, being very concerned and fearful of Iran, its neighbor across the Persian Gulf, is trying to galvanize its relationships with Egypt, with Jordan as a buffer, and with the West, the United States of America. Now, what is the king saying about this city-state that he wants to create? He wants the nations of the world to invest in Neom. He wants Europe, China, the United States, Asia. He wants them all to come here and to invest. And remember, investors, it's all going to be to your benefit because you're going to have freedom to move here, to move here. But there's one component that's a little bit of a sticking point. Bikinis. And the sticking point... <laughs> bikinis. No, not bikinis. The sticking point is Israel. Because if you want to access these all by land, you have this small little area down in southern Israel, Israel's only port on the Red Sea, called Eilat, right across from the sister city in Jordan, called Aqaba. You can see each one 
when you're in the one, you can see right across to the other, right across the Gulf. A beautiful, beautiful area. Now, back to this just for a moment. This area is rich in beautiful seaside vistas. The Red Sea is a stunning body of water. Turquoise waters, great un undersea life. Uh, some of the best barrier reefs on planet Earth for tourism. <coughs> also, huge <coughs> mountains. Believe it or not, I'm going to shock you with this one. Some of the mountains are so tall there, even in Saudi Arabia, that they have snow part of the year. So this area, Saudi Arabia envisions to be a huge tourist area with the finest of everything. Large port. Now this is where it gets really interesting. In order for them to, by land and this bridge, connect, they have to somehow get across the area of Israel. Now, Saudi Arabia has yet to really recognize Israel as a nation because of the pressure of Islam and the other nations of the Middle East that are Islamic. Of course, Israel has always been the odd man out. However, behind the scenes, because of their concern, because of Israel's concern and Saudi Arabia's concern over Iran, Israel and Saudi Arabia have been quietly working together on military things and geopolitical strategies for several years now. So behind the scenes, they get along pretty well. It is in public where they have to, particularly for Saudis, they have to look antagonistic towards Israel. But behind the scenes, they're working very nicely on a lot of different projects. Now, why is this significant? Because you have to triangulate a lot of different components. Right now, if you're in Asia and you want to send goods by ship, which is the most economic and quickest way to move goods, where do you have to go if you want to get from China to Spain. What's the route you have to take if you're going Suez by ship? Canal. The Suez Canal. So you're going to come up through the Red Sea, <coughs> up here, and you're going to go very slow, slowly, through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean Sea. This Suez Canal is so crucially important because it links by a body of water, man-made of course, it links Asia to Europe and beyond. It's a crucial point that connects the bodies of water. And for trade, it's critical. China is looking to diversify its trade routes. They are creating what's called the New Silk Road. They have several crossing points by land going through Russia and Kazakhstan all the way to Europe. But the only and most important one by sea is this route right here. So for Europe and for China trading, this is crucial. However, China wants to diversify and diminish its risk. So how's it going to do that? By taking advantage of a high-speed train that Israel has already agreed to have built by China that comes up to Israel's nuclear facility location, which you didn't hear that from me, in Demona, over to Beersheba, over to the port of Ashdod, where our cruise ship just landed last week and on to Tel Aviv and eventually to Haifa. Ashdod is actually slightly smaller in, as a port than Haifa in the north of Israel. So what does this do? By creating this high-speed train that can take containers off of ships, you essentially compete with the Suez Canal in Egypt for much of the trade on planet Earth that's going by sea. So what you have is China and all of Asia can come up into this location, offload it at the port of Eilat in Israel, high-speed rail it over to the port of Ashdod or even further up to Haifa, and off to Europe. So China is getting into the mix of this too. So Saudi Arabia is saying, we see the potential for shipping, for controlling the whole area. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and they're going to need Israel in the mix in order to, to really compete and give another option away from the Suez Canal in Egypt, which is incidentally very slow and very costly. So this gives them a whole other route. All of this becomes so significant when you're reading Revelation chapter 17 and 18 because there's a special judgment reserved by God for an entity described in those chapters called mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. There is a religious 
and there is a political and economic component to all of this. And when God destroys mystery, Babylon the Great, when God destroys that entity, it's clear from the text that the merchants and those who are on the sea are are covering themselves with ashes on their head and saying never was there a city like this city because nobody buys all of our wares anymore. It is clear from scripture, I believe, not only in Revelation 17 and 18, but also when you go back to the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and other passages, which in a final last days scenario, clear from the scriptures, when it's prophesying the destruction of Babylon in the last days, it's giving us a clear understanding that this entity, whoever she is, this mystery Babylon the Great, is in a desert, is by water, is living in excess, has the blood of the martyrs, has drunk the blood of the martyrs um, who've been killed through the ages, um, and so many other descriptions that are there. As a matter of fact, when you go into the book of, I believe it is Jeremiah, there's a, a specific passage that describes the last day's wrath of God in this region, and it says, and the cry at the destruction, the cry was heard in the Red Sea. Specific passages, and I don't have time to get into it. I wanted to share this with you simply because I think that potentially it has enormous ramifications for the last days, and I wanted you to know, literally last week, this neon was was um, announced so keep an eye on it again it's going to take some time to develop I'm not saying that this is it but I'm saying that that there are a lot of reasons from a biblical perspective that this may fit the description in in the passages of scripture and you have you have big international entities that want to see it happen China is putting billions and hundreds of billions behind their plans to create new silk trade routes, the new silk road, so to speak. This one's called the Maritime Silk Route. They, silk road. The they, they have, and they have come to <coughs> Israel and Saudi Arabia have great relations with China. Mm -hmm. So they have come to Israel and they're very interested um, in creating another alternative to the Suez Canal. Um, so I, I've read that the, the deal has already been inked for, and as a matter of fact, when you look at when you look here at a lot, a lot has a very very short waterfront because it's only just a little speck on the map. Um, you can drive from you can drive from Israel's border with Jordan to <coughs> Israel's border with Egypt in 15 minutes. So I mean, it's very close, and it's pretty well developed, and it's a combination of luxury hotels and port facilities for cargo ships and those kinds of things. So what they're actually talking about doing to, to be able to have a larger port is to, to dig a canal that's going to go five kilometers inland to make a larger area inland for the port. And that will connect to the, the train that will go up. And this is all mountainous in here, big mountains. So very difficult to create a, a train in that location. but. This is the largest fault line, on, one of the largest fault lines on planet Earth, called the Syrian-African Rift. And the Sea of Galilee is part of that rift, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. And then this area here is called the Araba, this whole region right there. It's, <coughs> it's a large valley between mountains and, of the mountains of Israel and the mountains of Moab, and then down here, Edom, Edom, ancient Edom. So there's a large valley that runs up here. So it makes sense for the train to go up that direction to move up here through the valley, the path of least resistance, to an area called Demona, which we actually did some servant's heart work uh, in Demona, that, that region, Beersheba, and then right up here, again, it's flatter in this location, so it's an easier way for the train to move up to the port of Ashdod, right? And this, uh, by moving the port inland five kilometers, they'll actually have more space to be able to offload all of those kinds of things to move it up further. The other thing is that, that Israel is already right now building a new international airport right here um, in the valley, in the flatlands. So the train will actually come down here, connect to the airport, and then down to Elad as well. Okay? So it's a lot of geopolitics, but I really think it's important to understand geography and to know these things because when, 
read Revelation 17 and 18 and and look at the, the description of Mystery Babylon the Great and see how it compares to the kind of things that you're seeing here. And particularly when you're looking at a city-state, which is a, a essentially an autonomous <coughs> city with new laws, new infrastructure, new administrators, and the king of Saudi Arabia said to all the investors who want to participate in this, <coughs> that you can help to fashion the new laws. So in other words, he's, he's pulling them in and saying, if you, if you want to play here, if you want to invest here, you can help to create the new laws and the new, administra new administration to run it. <coughs>